Super Smash Bros., or as it's known in Japan, Nintendo All-Star, Great Frey, Smash Bros., had been an unexpected success, becoming the fifth best-selling game on the Nintendo 64. Nintendo initially believed that the game would struggle to find an audience. However, it managed to steadily build a fanbase with its innovative and accessible gameplay. Fans would begin to speculate about what characters they could see in a sequel, and with rumours of Nintendo's new console on the horizon, it seemed obvious that a new Smash game was on the way. But the series creator had his doubts about the series, and was unsure what a sequel would look like. Masahiro Sakurai and the team at HAL Laboratories had been dedicated to making the best game they possibly could, but due to the limited budget and a tight development schedule, the complete idea that Sakurai had envisioned ended up falling short. After an all-steer development and initial slow sales, Sakurai was uncertain if creating a sequel was a good idea. However, eventually his perfectionism would override his reservations, and he would set out to try and create not just a sequel, but the definitive version of Smash Brothers. <laughs> In early 1999, Super Smash Bros. was released in Japan, and Sakurai was proud of what he and his team had achieved by creating a fighting game that challenged the traditional conventions of the genre. Smash Bros. was steadily building a strong following, which now had the potential to spread as Nintendo was planning to give Smash an international release. However, Sakurai was still unsure what was next for him. Smash clearly had potential, but Sakurai was unsure about the next step for the series. If we make a sequel to Smash Bros, I'm honestly unsure what we should change. If we add a new element to the gameplay, there's always a chance fans won't like it. On the Japanese Smash Bros website, a poll was opened up to the fans, asking if there was a Smash 2, who would you want to see recruited? It was specified on the site that Smash 2 was not planned, this list was being made just in case. In 1999, Sakurai attended E3 in Los Angeles, a huge event in gaming where all of the biggest companies come together to showcase what games and technology they're planning to release in the coming years. This year was particularly important, as everybody was talking about the next generation of games consoles. Sega were showing off their futuristic looking Dreamcast, and Nintendo's biggest rival Sony were talking about the PlayStation 2, and Nintendo announced their next console, codenamed Dolphin. However, during E3, Nintendo did not show off any hardware. They only spoke about the technical specifications. Their main focus was showcasing some of the biggest upcoming titles for the Nintendo 64 and Game Boy Color. However, there was one game being showcased that seemed out of place. One game that had already been released in the US and Japan. Super Smash Bros. was that game, and Sakurai was there to help showcase it. It's never been clarified why exactly Nintendo had decided to show Smash Bros. at E3, as most people attending E3 were part of the gaming industry, and were already aware of the game's existence and release weeks prior. Whatever the reason, it would prove to be a beneficial choice for Nintendo, as while attending the event, Sakurai made the decision to make a new Smash Bros. game. Perhaps it was seeing the potential next generation of competition from other companies. Perhaps Sakurai and Nintendo realised Smash Bros. was the perfect candidate for a launch title, as it celebrates all things Nintendo, and it would appeal to fans of all of their iconic series. Sakurai was now imbued with a burning passion to create a game that would eclipse the previous game in depth, and scope. Now that Sakurai was determined to create the definitive Smash title, he was a man on a mission. On July 5th, 1999, the internal design document for the next Smash Brothers was finished, months ahead of the European release of Smash 64. The Japanese title made it clear that the intention was to build and improve upon the original in every aspect, Super Smash Brothers Deluxe. To the rest of the world, it would simply be known as Super Smash Brothers Melee. As the second game in the series, Sakurai was aiming to make it the biggest game possible. There isn't a definitive date from when development started on Melee, but it is believed to have started around early fall 2000. The game would be developed quickly in just 13 months, and in that time Sakurai would work relentlessly, trying his hardest to bring his vision to life. The previous game did well enough that Nintendo and the character designers knew what I wanted in advance, and I wanted a lot. Being one of the early titles for Nintendo's next generation console, Sakurai wanted Melee to show the world what the platform was capable of. The Dolphin, later renamed to the Nintendo GameCube, was set to be one of the most powerful consoles of its generation, beating out the Dreamcast and PlayStation 2 on performance and price. Nintendo were looking to be back on top after being bested in sales by the Sony PlayStation in the previous generation. This new generation of consoles were set to be a huge step forward, as the fifth generation had marked the beginnings of true polygonal gaming on consoles. And although some games would manage to become classics in their own right, there were clear limitations to what was possible on the hardware. 
Now this new sixth generation would be capable of realizing a developer's creative vision in 3D, with increased power, offering higher levels of detail and storage. The GameCube was Nintendo's first system that would use a disc-based format, although it was not the standard DVD size. These 8cm mini DVDs could store up to 1.5GB of data, quite a sizable upgrade over the Nintendo 64's 64MB cartridges. Sakurai wanted to utilise everything this console had to offer, and make this new game a showpiece for the potential of the GameCube, while shattering the expectations of fans. I'm extremely motivated, people's expectations are higher than ever, and I want to contribute to the future of this new hardware, the GameCube. Those were the words of Sakurai on the 17th of May, when Melee was first announced to the public through a post on the new Smash Bros. website. In this post, he would also detail how much larger the production team was for this project, and also how this may perhaps be his last large-scale project. Whilst this post was made public to the world, on the same day in Los Angeles, the GameCube was being unveiled to the press, and the first game shown would be Super Smash Bros. Melee opening with the game's introductory cutscene, which Sakurai had started working on during his New Year's break, and had painstakingly planned every detail with his sound team, so every shot and musical cue would line up perfectly, as the opening movie's graphics would be handled by multiple outside companies. All of this work would culminate into an impressive first showing for the game, wowing the audience with its stunning visuals and epic score. But this was just one track of many. One of the aspects Sakurai wanted to push this time around was music. In Smash 64, composer Hirokazu Ando created all of the tracks in MIDI. As the Nintendo 64 had some limitations when it came to audio, the limited storage space offered by cartridges meant that CD quality audio samples, as seen in the Sony PlayStation, were not possible. Also, the N64 did not have a separate audio chip, so all audio processing would have to share power with the central processing unit and the co-processor. With the GameCube, Nintendo wanted to catch up to the competition. Their new mini-DVD format and integrated audio processor would make that possible. And Sakurai wanted to make sure that they would make the most of this technology to reimagine some of the classic Nintendo soundtracks in the modern era. Initially, Sakurai wasn't too impressed by some of the early compositions produced by Ando, feeling that the work wasn't taking full advantage of the GameCube's capability. He stated, The music only sounded like a slightly better version of a Smash 64 track. The team were finding it hard to understand what Sakurai was aiming for, as he would often try to explain what he wanted through deep analogies, as he would try to convey the sense of duty and responsibility he felt for the game and all of the game series involved. All of a sudden, we have the GameCube, and I'm trying to explain anything is possible. This is what the customers want. One year from now, this is how things will be. And I wanted to say, that's why we need to be here now, but I don't think that's easy to convey. The PlayStation had been offering CD quality audio for years, and Sakurai wanted to show what was possible beyond this increase in sound quality. What was the absolute pinnacle of what could be achieved with this technology? And the way to attain this lofty vision would finally become clear when he and his sound team Shogosaki and Hirokazu Ando would decide to truly push the standards of the industry, they would need an orchestra. Initially though, it seemed to be a struggle in order to get the higher-ups to agree, but the team were dead set on having an orchestra, with Sakurai even offering to pay the fee out of his own pocket. I didn't understand what this game was supposed to look like when it was done, and I didn't understand what was being asked of me. When I finally understood how serious we were about this, and how important our work was, was when we started talking about using a live orchestra. What really made an impression on me was during the first meeting. Mr. Sakurai said, we're definitely doing this. I was a little reluctant, but Sakurai said if the company wouldn't pay for the orchestra fees, he would pay them out of his own pocket. Those few words said it all, and I realized there was gonna be no way out of this. From there, it was, we're going to do this, no matter what. Sakurai's passion for the project was immense. Within the team, he became infamous for rejecting work that he didn't feel lived up to the standards of Smash Bros. 
as Sakurai wanted to make sure every track was a perfect recreation, true to the spirit of the original, that the fans and the creators of the original games would expect. He wanted to include as much as possible for fans, and this desire would extend far past the soundtrack. Coming into the sequel, fans were excited, wanting to see their favourite Nintendo characters in the game. In a poll on the Smash Bros Dojo, asking fans what characters they'd want to see in a sequel, some were even hoping to see characters from other IPs too. As Smash 64 had a tight development, we now know four characters that were planned for the game that had to be cut during development. Bowser was cut quite late into development, as he was believed to be playable at one point, as in an interview with Shigeru Miyamoto, he stated Bowser would appear as a playable character. King DDD from Kirby was playable at one point, but scrapped due to time constraints. Mewtwo from Pokemon and Marth from Fire Emblem were also planned, but cut. When starting the game, you have a solid amount of characters, 14, starting with four newcomers, Peach from Super Mario, Ice Climbers from the NES game of the same name, Bowser from Super Mario, and Zelda from The Legend of Zelda. These new characters all brought something unique to the game. The Ice Climbers were a duo. The player directly controls Popo, the blue climber, and Nana, the pink climber, mirrors all of his movements. Nana can be knocked out separately, and Popo can continue fighting. However, your attacks become weaker, and your up B attack doesn't recover as well. Bowser was the first villain character playable in Smash, and one of the heaviest hitting fighters. Princess Peach has incredible sideways recovery, with her second jump being able to hover and her up B allowing her to glide. Princess Zelda has the ability to transform into Sheik, her alter ego from Ocarina of Time, giving her a completely different moveset and more agile movement. Although Sheik is not selectable from the character select screen, you can start around as her if you hold A whilst the level is loading. If you include Sheik, the roster comes in at 15 right from the start. That's three more characters than the original game. Even with all of these characters, fans were still teased with a further five unlockable slots. However, by playing through the game, you're able to unlock a further 11 characters, including Luigi and Jigglypuff from 64, and newcomers such as Falco from Star Fox, Pichu, a pre-evolution of Pikachu from the second generation of Pokemon, Dr. Mario, a variation of Mario based on his appearance in the puzzle game of the same name, Young Link, a variant of Link based on his younger appearance in Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask. Ganondorf, the recurring antagonist from the Legend of Zelda series. His appearance here is based on his Gerudo form seen in Ocarina of Time. Mewtwo from Pokemon, one of the most requested characters in the poll, and one of the most iconic characters in the Pokemon series. Mr. Game & Watch, a character that pays tribute to Nintendo's early beginnings, being based off Nintendo's early handheld Game & Watch games. His different attacks are all based on different Game & Watch titles Nintendo produced. Marth and Roy are characters from the Japan-only series Fire Emblem, although Sakurai was unsure whether to include these characters in the international releases, as outside of Japan, players would not know who they were. However, this ended up helping to increase awareness of Fire Emblem in the West, helping it to find an audience when the series would eventually start getting released overseas. Whilst fans were happy to see this many characters added to the roster, some drew criticism due to the fact that their movesets were based off of already existing characters with minor tweaks. These characters were labelled as clone characters such as Young Link is a faster, lighter version of Link. Ganondorf is a slower but stronger version of Captain Falcon. Falco is almost identical to Fox with a stronger laser and weaker recovery. Pichu copies Pikachu's movesets, except his electric moves now damage himself. Roy is the same as Marth, except for having fire effects on his B specials and having a different sweet spot on his attacks. And Dr. Mario is exactly the same as Mario, although his fireballs are now pills, he's a little bit stronger but has slightly worse recovery. But overall, fans and critics were happy to see this many characters in the game. Many could forgive the clone character movesets, as visually, the same high level of attention to detail that was seen in the original Smash Bros. was seen here too, and characters felt even more like a true tribute to their legacy games, and this higher level of detail was also extended to the new stages. Starting the game you'll have 18 brand new stages, with 5 more secret slots being teased. However, there are actually a further 11 stages you can unlock, bringing the total number of stages to an impressive 29. The stages in Melee feature larger and more interactive stages, with some stages completely transforming throughout the match. These expanded stages allow for better representation of the Nintendo franchises included in Smash, with stages from the F-Zero and Earthbound series appearing for the first time. The stages included are Peach's Castle and Rainbow Cruise, based on their appearance in Super Mario 64, as well as Mushroom Kingdom 1 and 2, based on the NES games, Super Mario 1 and 2 respectively. Yoshi receives two stages, with one based on Yoshi's story, 
and Yoshi's Island being based on its depiction in Super Mario World. Congo Jungle and Jungle Japes are here from the Donkey Kong series. Star Fox has two stages, Corneria and Venom. From The Legend of Zelda we have Great Bay, based on the area from Majora's Mask, and Temple, which is based on the palaces seen in Zelda 2 The Adventures of Link. Kirby has two stages, Green Greens and The Fountain of Dreams. The Ice Climber stage, Icicle Mountain, is a never-ending scrolling stage, where players must fight to stay on the screen. F-Zero receives its first stages in the Smash franchise, with Mute City and the secret stage, Big Blue. The Earthbound series also receives its first stages, represented by Onet and the secret stage, Foreside. Metroid receives an updated version of Planet Zebus, now called Brinstar, and a secret stage, Brinstar Depths, which features the boss character Kraid from the Metroid series. Pokemon receives two new stages, including Pokemon Stadium, a stage based upon the Pokemon anime in which the stage will change terrain type, reflective of the different Pokemon types, and Poker Floats. The less said about this one, the better. Mr. Game & Watch's stage, Flat Zone, is a tribute to the games which inspired him. Specifically, it's based upon the Game & Watch game Helmet, in which the player would attempt to get from one side of the screen to the other whilst dodging falling objects. The stages Battlefield and Final Destination also mark the first time original stages based on the Smash Bros. universe were selectable in multiplayer. And there are also three returning stages from Smash 64, Congo Jungle, Dreamland, and Yoshi's Story. One of the key elements that made Smash 64 stand out was its simple control scheme, which made it much easier for new players to pick up and play. However, there were some advanced techniques in the game that added extra depth for more competitive players. Sakurai wanted to preserve this balance as much as possible, so in Melee there were only some minor additions made to the controls and mechanics. A new special move was added, Side B, to every character, giving characters more options for attacks or recovery. Smash attacks can now be charged, increasing the damage the longer they're held. You can now throw in four directions and pummel characters whilst they're grabbed. Air dodging and sidestepping have been implemented. There are also some new mechanics added to the game that were not openly listed in the manual such as teching, also known as breakfall, which allows characters to recover from a strong attack rather than bouncing off of the surface. Wall jumps give some characters extra mobility, however this can only be performed by some characters. Big shield, by holding down the shield button lightly, you can get a larger shield covering more of your character. And tethered recovery allows characters with ranged grabs to hook onto the edge of the stage, giving them another recovery option. Melee had an overall different feel to Smash 64. The game felt faster, gameplay felt tighter, less floaty, and more aggressive. All of the added mechanics gave players more options and versatility while still keeping the controls simple. However, Melee would end up being quite a bit more demanding for players. If you look at the two games side by side, you can get a sense of the more complex gameplay, as players would have to react more quickly to survive in Melee. Sakurai would go on to describe Melee as the sharpest game in the series, and he also said the dazzling exchange of skills was the game's most exhilarating aspect, and that Melee's popularity fundamentally rested on the game's speed. On top of these gameplay tweaks, the total number of items was over doubled from 15 in Smash 64 to an impressive 31 items. Sakurai and his team were not pulling any punches, and wanted to show everyone just how much they could add to keep players entertained. One of the most common complaints that fighting games usually receive is that there's a lack of single player content. Smash 64 fans also felt outside of the challenge games and one player arcade mode, there wasn't enough content. Some fighting games had started expanding their games with additional modes that helped to add more value to the game. Tekken is one of the best examples of this, with its unorthodox modes such as Tekken Force, a side-scrolling beat-em-up inspired by the likes of Final Fight and Double Dragon, Tekken Bowl, a bowling minigame, and Tekken Ball, which is beach ball played with fighting game controls, which by the way, actually has a competitive scene and has been seen played at tournaments. Not to be outdone by the competition, Sakurai had some ideas on how to expand the single-player experience for Melee. Classic Mode is an updated version of the one-player mode seen in Smash 64, seeing you go through seven fights broken up with three bonus stages, break the target's returns, as well as an updated version of Race to the Finish, featuring branching paths, and there's also a new mode called Grab the Trophy. Once again, on the final stage you'll have to fight against Master Hand, and if you manage to reach this stage in 18 minutes or less on normal or harder, the player will be treated to a surprise fight against a new boss, Crazy Hand. 
Adventure is an all new mode that pays tribute to all of the different franchises included in Super Smash Bros. Each stage is based upon a different game series, featuring some areas where you'll platform through levels. These even feature enemies from the original games. Adventure is incredibly ambitious and feels like a mode only Sakurai would attempt to create, feeling like a true dream for fans. Stage 1 has you starting out platforming through the Mushroom Kingdom, heading to Peach's castle, ending with a fight on its roof against Peach and Mario. Stage 2 features combat only stages in Congo Jungle facing off against two small Donkey Kongs and one giant one. Stage 3 is based upon Hyrule Castle from The Legend of Zelda, with you searching for the Triforce in its underground maze. Afterwards you'll have to fight with Zelda. Brinstar is based upon the area from Metroid and will see you battling Samus before the planet begins to self-destruct, and the player has to race against the clock back to a ship to escape the explosion. Stage 5, Green Greens, features you fighting against Kirby in his many copy variations. If you can finish these fights in 30 seconds or less, there's an optional fight against Giant Kirby. Stage 6, Corneria, features you fighting against Fox, with a second battle against a more aggressive Fox with backup from his wingmen, Slippy, Falco, and Peppy. If you've unlocked Falco, then he'll replace Fox. Stage 7, Pokemon Stadium, features an all-out Pokemon battle, with Pokeballs being the only item. Stage 8, F-Zero Grand Prix. On this stage, players will have to run to the finish whilst avoiding a group of F-Zero racers on the way, before ending with a fight against Captain Falcon. Stage 9, Onet, sees you fighting three Nesses in his hometown from the game Earthbound, or as it's known in Japan, Mother. Stage 10, Icicle Mountain. On this stage, you'll have to climb up the Ice Climbers stage whilst avoiding enemies from the original Ice Climbers game, ending with a fight against two Ice Climbers. Stage 11, Battlefield, sees you fighting against this game's version of the fighting polygon team, the Wireframes. The player must defeat 15 Wireframes whilst fighting in low gravity, before fighting Metal Mario, who will be accompanied by Luigi if you've unlocked him. And finally, Stage 12, Final Destination, where you'll have to fight against a giant Bowser. If the player manages to reach the end of Adventure Mode and defeat Bowser in 18 minutes or less, you'll have to fight Giga Bowser, a monstrously big and powerful version of Bowser, for extra bonus points. And once all characters have been unlocked, All-Star appears in the single player menu. All-Star is an endurance test where the player will have to fight through the entire melee roster across 12 stages, each broken up with a rest area. Damage is carried across fights, but in the rest area the player is given 3 heart containers they can use to recover. These items do not get replenished so the player must use them sparingly. All-Star was inspired by a mode Sakurai had developed for Kirby. In Kirby's Adventure, the mode vs. Boss has you running through all of the bosses one after another, and in Kirby Superstar, Sakurai iterated upon this mode with the Arena, in which Kirby must fight through all of the game's bosses again, but broken up with rest areas, which offers Kirby a copy ability and healing items. Event Match is a new mode that puts the player in scenarios where the player must complete a specific objective before the time runs out. Some of these events are inspired by scenes from the original games, and will have you playing as a specific character such as recreating the Shadow Link fight from Zelda 2 and Ocarina of Time. There are 10 stages to start with, but more will become unlocked as the player completes events and unlocks more characters. There are a total of 51 event matches, with the final stage being a particularly tough 3 on 1 fight against Mewtwo, Ganondorf and Giga Bowser. Another new section on the single player menu is Stadium, which features two new modes and the returning target test featuring all new stages for each character on the roster. Also featured is the new home run contest, in which the player is given 10 seconds to do as much damage to a sandbag as possible and then must send it flying as far as they can. This mode would prove quite addictive as the player must figure out the optimum strategy to maximize their distance. Another new mode found in the stadium is Multiman Melee. This mode is essentially the fighting wireframe team stage from Adventure Mode, but with multiple variations. And if all of this content wasn't enough for some players, Sakurai had another addition to help satisfy the hardcore completionists and pay tribute to Nintendo's history at the same time. Trophies. In the opening cutscene of the game, you can see the characters are represented as trophies come to life. As you play through Classic, Adventure and All-Star Mode, you'll unlock a trophy of the character you completed it with with each mode having a unique trophy for each character. The classic version is based on their original games, and the other two are based on their appearance in Melee. Each trophy features a detailed 3D model, with a description detailing information about the character, serving as an archive of sorts for the player, so they can look through and learn more about the characters and their original games. However, not only are there trophies based on playable characters, there are also trophies based on items, stages, enemies, and even characters from Nintendo's history that don't appear in the game. Some of these trophies also mark the first time these characters have been represented in 3D. 
Players can collect trophies in multiple ways. During Adventure, Classic and All-Star, random trophies can be found during fights. They can also be collected in the Grab the Trophy bonus stage from Classic, as well as the Lottery minigame that uses coins you earn by playing the game. The more coins you spend, the higher chance of getting a new trophy. Some trophies are only made available after fulfilling specific criteria. In total, there are 290 trophies to collect, and there are a further three that were obtainable in the Japanese version of the game. However, these can be unlocked by the use of a cheat device. The Samus Unmasked and Mario and Yoshi trophies were unlocked for players at special events in Japan, and the trophy Tamagon was obtainable through normal gameplay. On top of all of this single-player content, Sakurai and his team spared no expense when it came to the multiplayer suite of modes as well. Versus Mode returns with new and expanded options, so players can tweak the gameplay how they see fit. Timed, stock and team battles and other settings return, however some new rule sets have been added. Coin Mode sees players pummeling each other in order to collect coins from their opponents. The player with the most coins at the end wins. And Bonus Mode, where players are awarded bonuses based on their performance in matches. These are the same bonuses that players receive at the end of stages in single player modes. On top of the standard verses, there's also other modes available under Special Melee such as camera mode, which allows the players to control the camera and save screenshots to the memory card. Stamina mode plays more like a traditional fighting game, as instead of knocking players off the screen, they are given 150 health points, and the last player standing wins. Super Sudden Death, both players start with 300% damage, so one strong hit will knock players immediately off. Giant and Tiny Melee changes the size of the characters respectively. Invisible Melee makes all characters invisible. Fixed Camera Mode has the camera locked in a wide shot of the entire stage. Single Button Mode disables all buttons except the control stick and A button. Lightning and Slow Mo Melee changes the speed of the game respectively. And also outside of Special Melee, there's Tournament Mode, which allows players to create their own tournament tree with up to 64 competitors taking part. Compared to its predecessor and most other fighting games, even to this day, the amount of content and features offer quite a lot of value, even for players who primarily play in single player. Super Smash Bros. Melee felt like a game that was paying tribute not only to the games represented in it, but the games that inspired it, paying special attention to the creators and the fans of those games. The first game had managed to stand on its own to become a surprising success, but now the sequel was designed to be a killer app to showcase the potential of the GameCube. And now it was time to see what the public would think of the game. Super Smash Bros. Melee was released on November 21st, 2001 in Japan, just two months after the GameCube first released, and it became the fastest selling GameCube game, with over 350,000 units sold in four days. This success continued as the game sold more than a million units only two months after its release, making it the first GameCube title to reach a million copies sold, and it would go on to sell a total of 1.39 million units. The game also sold well in North America when it was released on December 3rd, 2001, when it sold 250,000 copies in just 9 days. It would go on to sell 4.41 million units, leading the game to become the 19th best-selling video game in 2001 in the US. On May 24th, 2002, Melee was released in Europe, and would go on to sell 1.04 million units. And on May 31st, 2002, the game would be released in Australia, selling a further 220,000 units. In total, Super Smash Bros. Melee sold 7.41 million units. It was the top-selling game on the GameCube and one of the highest reviewed as well. Fans would call it a must-play title. Overall, Super Smash Bros. Melee was a success, but the GameCube was struggling in sales against the original Xbox and the monstrously successful PlayStation 2. The PlayStation 2 was the console of choice for many, as in addition to being a games console, it also allowed users to watch DVDs and most standalone DVD players were quite expensive at the time. Microsoft entered into the sixth generation as well, stealing away Nintendo's claims of having the most powerful console, as the Xbox would feature substantially more power than the GameCube. These factors would mean that the GameCube sold even less than the Nintendo 64 worldwide. However, many fans and reviewers would agree Nintendo's exclusive games would make owning the console a worthwhile investment, and Super Smash Bros. Melee would be cited as one of, if not the defining reasons, to own a GameCube. Fans and reviewers alike praised the game for improving on the original in every aspect. Visually, it served as a showpiece for the power of the GameCube, with greatly increased detail on the characters and stages, all shown at a smooth frame rate that would never drop. Although fans were overjoyed with Melee, 
Sakurai was not quite content. The development had taken quite a toll on him, as it was his biggest, most ambitious project he'd ever directed. He felt an immense amount of pressure, as his aim was not only to meet the standards of fans, but also to surpass them, whilst also pushing the capabilities of the GameCube, which featured a lot of different technologies that the team at HAL Labs had not worked with before. And on top of all this, the game had a very tight development cycle, with the game being developed in just 13 months. Trying to hit its initial release date was incredibly difficult, and even saw Satoru Iwata jumping in to help with debugging during the final hours of development, even though he had since left HAL Laboratories in order to work for Nintendo in their corporate planning division. On a personal level, Melee had an extremely gruelling development cycle. Some of my other games did too, but Melee sticks out far ahead of the pack in my mind. I worked on that game for 13 months straight, without a single Sunday or holiday off that whole time. During parts of it, I was living a really destructive lifestyle. I'd work for over 40 hours in a row and then go back home and sleep for four. Sakurai wanted to ensure all of the work done on the game was up to the highest standards possible, so he was heavily involved with every part of development. At one point, Sakurai even collapsed from exhaustion after a recording session where they had just finished recording the orchestral opening theme. You actually collapsed after the orchestra finished recording. The day after, I was put on an IV at the hospital. I feel like people might make assumptions if I don't clear up what happened, so I'll talk about it. I was visualizing the opening movie in my head and listening to the orchestra perform in the studio. I was checking whether the music and visuals aligned, going, this matches, this is off, this is right, this is wrong, in real time. And I was concentrating very hard because the movie would have to be edited according to my notes. And I had to make snap judgments every moment about how to make adjustments when the music and visuals didn't quite line up. And it was exhausting. Although I can't deny I was already overworked and fatigued. Although he had directed games in the past, the size and scale of Melee dwarfed his previous projects and perhaps highlighted some areas where Sakurai had yet to develop his directing skills. At times, he would have issues conveying what he wanted to the team. When I look at the work of directors and producers of other companies, I realize that I lean more towards the player side than the director side, and I've started to believe that more and more as of late. All I could tell the team was, hey, go make a good game. But since Mr. Sakurai is representing the fans, if he says he wants something, or that something is fun, that means the fans want it too. I think that's great. Well, that isn't always understood though. Despite the game's overall success and the dedicated fan base's love for the game, Sakurai was left feeling that Smash Bros. Melee might have been a misstep. In Japan, it had sold less than Smash 64, and Sakurai felt the new, faster, more technical gameplay was straying away from one of the core values that the original strove for, accessibility. Generally, at the time, as fighting games were iterated upon, each new game tended to become more technically challenging, as veteran players would be looking for a new challenge. However, this approach makes each new game harder and harder for newcomers. Sakurai had originally intended for Smash to stand against these barriers for new players, barriers that inhibit people from being able to pick up the game and immediately have fun. I think a lot of Melee players love Melee, but at the same time, I think a lot of players on the other hand gave up on Melee because it's too technical because they can't keep up with it. And I know there were players who got tendonitis from playing and messing with the controller so much. And that is really hard on the player. And I feel a game should really focus on what the target audience is. However, Sakurai and HAL Laboratories could have never predicted how many players did want to play competitively. Although there were fans who enjoyed playing Smash 64 competitively, it couldn't compare to the scene that would build around Melee. Melee ignited something in players who were hooked, not just by its approachable nature, but by its potential as a competitive game. Many players began by testing their skills against their friends until they felt they had mastered the game and wanted to show their skills to a wider audience. Local and national tournaments were being set up in the US, and websites such as Smashboards went online in 2001, and a community was beginning to build. Players were now not just limited to their local friend groups anymore. There were thousands of other players dedicated to Smash across the world, and now they could be connected, and they all wanted to push the limits of what was possible in Smash. Players began to find hidden mechanics and quirks in the game, which would lead to them implementing them into combos to gain any advantage possible. Wave dashing, wave landing, pivoting, L cancelling, and SDI are just some of the techniques that players discovered. Ultimately, the game became so much faster and more technically complex than any of the developers could have imagined. 
High level competitive play would almost look like an entirely different game altogether. No items, Final Destination Fox only has become a mantra for the competitive scene, as they would endeavour to make Smash a more balanced experience. By removing random elements such as stage hazards and items, anything that would detract from pure technical skill. The Smash competitive scene was a kind of grassroots effort, with the community setting up tournaments themselves, at players' houses, gymnasium and hotel convention rooms, with small prize pools for top positions. These would get bigger and bigger, and some tournaments would see up to 98 players entering. However, it wasn't until MLG NYC 04 that Smash started to be taken seriously as a competitive game. This influence would steadily grow, with MLG sponsoring and setting up tournaments for Melee, and bringing Smash onto their roster of games. Now Smash tournaments would take place alongside Halo tournaments on the MLG Pro Circuit. All seemed well as the Smash community was growing. However, after three years of support, MLG decided to drop Smash from their Pro Circuit roster. It seemed MLG's roster had decided to focus on more popular shooter titles, including Gears of War, Rainbow Six Vegas, Shadow Run, whilst keeping Halo 2 on their roster. However, the competitive scene would continue, as in 2007, EVO would invite Melee to be part of their tournament. EVO is the biggest fighting games tournament in the US, and would see Smash played alongside Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, Third Strike, Capcom vs SNK 2, Marvel vs Capcom 2, and Virtua Fighter 5. The tournament was an important milestone, as Smash was finally being recognised by the fighting game community that had ignored it for so long. However, the following year, Melee was dropped from the lineup. Many thought the competitive scene for Melee was over. After EVO 2007, it seemed Melee had hit its peak, and it was time to move on. After all, Melee was six years old at this point. But the fans had other ideas, and the competitive Smash scene would continue. Just because Melee wasn't being supported in any official capacity did not mean the fans would stop playing it. The Smash community is one of the most passionate fighting game communities, continuing to support Melee for years. It even managed to get back into EVO in 2013 after a huge community effort, where they managed to raise $94,000 to have the game rejoin EVO's roster. And Smash Bros. Melee would maintain this slot until EVO 2019. 18 years after the game's initial release, Smash Bros was finally recognised as a competitive game. A game that managed to stand against the tradition set in the fighting game genre and carve out its own path by focusing on simplicity rather than technical complexity, and somehow managed to offer both to fans, cultivating one of the most dedicated fan bases in gaming, with many of the names who were there from the early beginnings still being figureheads and legends in the scene to this day. And all of this was achieved without the support of Nintendo. In fact, Nintendo initially tried to stop Melee from being shown at EVO 2013, before backing down hours later due to fan outcry. The community cultivated around Melee is astoundingly strong, and they have managed to survive long after the game's initial release. The level of passion and dedication that Sakurai and his team had shown making the game was only equal to, if not surpassed, by the passion of the fans. Many to this day hold Melee in the highest regards, some say it's the best game in the series, some the best on the GameCube, and some would even argue one of the greatest games of all time. With a bigger and more dedicated fanbase, a sequel seemed obvious, but fans would be left waiting as Sakurai went on to work on other projects, returning to the Kirby franchise to direct Kirby Air Ride, which released in 2003 for the GameCube. But after its completion, Sakurai ultimately decided it was time to leave HAL Laboratories. Now many were filled with questions, would the series continue without Sakurai? And could a new game even live up to the standards set by Melee? But the fans knew Sakurai's dedication was just as strong as their own, and a new Smash would happen when the time was right. And that time seemed to be drawing closer, as in 2005, Nintendo announced they were planning a revolution. And of course, Sakurai would have to take part. There's one more title I guess I should mention that will turn that fight into an absolute brawl. Thank you so much for watching. Sorry this video took quite a long time to make, but Melee is just such a huge game, and it's such a huge game to me as well, I wanted to make sure I did justice to it in the video. I would like to shout out Source Gaming 
for all of the information they have on their website, this video would not be possible without the tireless translating and research that they do. The guys over there are great and they've done so much great work for free, it's insane. And a huge shout out to East Point Pictures who did the Smash Brothers documentary series, which I used some clips of in the last section of the video and it was just a huge inspiration for me. Um, of course, I'm gonna be following this up with Brawl and I'm maybe gonna do some smaller videos in between because these projects do take a lot of work and a lot of time and it'd be nice to get some smaller things out there. Uh, if you enjoyed the video please drop it a like and if you know anyone who might enjoy this video please share it with them and subscribe if you'd like to see more. Thanks again and I'll see you next time.